Our guest today is Dr. Shamshir Vailil, founder and managing director of VPS Healthcare, a rapidly growing company in the UAE. Uh, Dr. Shamshir, thank you very much for joining us today on Knowledge at Wharton. Thank you, Mughal. Thank you for having me here. Uh, Mike, uh, and, and my co-host today is Dr. Mike Yassim, uh, director of the Leadership Center. Uh, Mike, would you like to get started? I will jump in, and Shamshir, welcome to the program here. Thank you, Mike. And a couple years back, you were a practicing radiologist. You practice medicine, and now you deliver medicine, and you deliver it to a lot of people. The last time I checked, some two million people, patients a year, come into one of your facilities. So just thinking about the transition from a practicing a person who practiced medicine to a person now who delivers medicine to a lot of others, what did it take to make that transition? Uh, I'm, I'm trained as a radiologist. I spent almost uh, 10 years of my life in medical training, then another two years for the, 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 the master's, and then uh, I realized that uh, as a radiologist, my life would be uh, more or less contained in the basements of the buildings of hospitals because all the radiology departments are in the basements and you don't see the sunlight. And I decided that my life uh, should be used for the larger uh, good of public. And uh, and being in a business family, you know, you always have that blood of uh, doing something by yourself. And uh, I worked for a year in the government hospital uh, in Abu Dhabi. Then I retired, resigned from the job and uh, didn't know what to do. So at that time, I didn't have any formal training uh, in business, but uh, I knew I had a, a strong desire to do something, to, to build a healthcare uh, system which could clearly bring out the change for, for the patient. So with that dream, I started, and uh, here I am with some good number of hospitals, good doctors, good team all around. So it's been a tremendous journey. You know, Shamshir, I think many people have the dream of one day becoming an entrepreneur themselves. And from your experience, you, first, you opened your first hospital, I think it was in 07. Uh, what did it take to finally make that decision? And then once you made it, what are some of the steps you took to begin to learn all the business skills you have to have to run an enterprise like a hospital? Uh, it's always a learning uh day, every day, you learn something new. And uh, as somebody who didn't uh, know how to run a business or uh, had no previous experience of running hospitals, it was it was a completely new uh, challenge. And I was enjoying that uh, journey to, to be there every day, uh, talk to the mechanics, talk to the, the contracting people, talk to them about construction, learn how the electromechanics work inside an operating room, uh, how the, uh, the wastewater should be ejected out of the hospitals. So everything was different, everything was learning. And I was very keen to learn. So I, I would be there early in the morning, spend 18, 20 hours without any problems, fully charged, uh, don't get sleep because of the excitement, and which is still the case uh, on, on, on some times when, when you have some interest projects. So uh, ability to learn was something which helped me a lot. I was, I was a good listener. I, I would listen to people and uh, I, I would accept that I didn't have any experience. So I hired the best people on the job. Yeah. You know, it's a very interesting point, and that is to become a leader of a hospital, your chief executive of the system, which includes medical centers, pharmaceutical deliveries, not just hospitals in three different continents. Um, you've had to become a general manager. You've had to do everything. You have to know everything. I say I'm the owner and the cleaner. You know? <laughs> That's very good. My, uh, my main focus is uh, I don't involve in operations. My important task every day is I have a team of 15 to 20 people who are all across uh, in different areas that we operate who gives feedback after talking to the patients. And I get all the, uh, most of the, 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 the impulse from, from the response from the patients. So I take it very seriously. And then I work backwards to the systems. If it's more waiting time, I need to talk to the CEO to, to see what can be done to reduce the times of waiting inside the emergency or in the pharmacy, or if it is an out of stock pharmacy situation, what to do to tackle it. So uh, pretty interesting. So you've built a very fast growing business. I believe you started in 2007 and you are now, as I understand it, close to a billion dollars worth of revenues. Uh, what was your strategy in building a business so rapidly uh, in the UAE? Uh, what were some of the steps you took? For to me, it there? was all about uh, building the capacity. You know, uh, I wanted to go where there were no facilities available. So for me, 
I didn't want to build a hospital and expect everyone to come to this particular to this particular building. I would uh, rather look at areas which were devoid of healthcare and go build capacity, improve the the capacity efficiency comes then then gives you that uh, ability to negotiate with your vendors. It brings down your operating expenses. You have uh, service line optimizations where you want to retain the best talent. You need to have certain volumes. So. That comes with capacity. So for me, I was more on, uh, I was not focused on the revenues at all. I knew if I focus on the quality and, and get good doctors, uh, that would bring me the revenue. So we went in for the accreditations. We, we got the US accreditations to start with. And that time it was not uh, really required by uh, any legal uh, standards. But we went and got all these things. And it started teaching us how to do things in a more systematic way. Even though we have a lot of anarchy, which comes with the growth that we have, but we have teams who are only focused on certain activities and they're not concerned about what's going around the group. So we have some people who are on the ground uh, firefighting things every day, but some people who are on the top who goes around building new centers like me, I'm, I'm more into uh, building capacity, I'm more into projects. You would see me at any point of time in one of those projects, there were sleeves rolled up. I still love to do it. And I think speed is of essence. We take decisions very fast. You know, we appreciate your courage in getting the everything going back in 07, and we also appreciate your courage in moving out of Abu Dhabi. You're still there, of course, but in addition, you have operations now in Oman, not too far away, London, that's pretty far away, India, uh, culturally quite a gap there, and you're here now in the U.S. to think about partnering with a couple of U.S. hospitals as well. Looking back on, on your movement out of your home territory, what have it's one of the more difficult cultural chasms you had to cross to make things work. See, it's always uh, the comfort zone that you leave when you go into a, a new territory or a new market. But you adapt very fast. You know the local cultural sensitivities. You know uh, what uh, ticks. You need to know the 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 the, the uh, you know the demand of the people. And I think if you can uh, be uh, Omani when you reach Oman, or or being in London, you have to behave the way that what they want to see and what they want to hear from you. So once we can adapt to the local requirements of the market, regardless of the market, and keeping the patient uh, need in the center. It, it works, and, and it's so good to, uh, uh, of a time to exploit and, and, and to grow fast because technology has grown. Uh, you could reach uh, any part of the world. Tomorrow morning, I'm having some meetings in London. I fly back to Abu Dhabi the same night. The next day, I have something else. So you can't be in a better position than uh, uh, what you can dream about. So just use the time and uh, take decisions. So if you were to look back on your journey, uh, and I assume that in the past seven or eight years, it's just barely begun. What have been some of the most testing challenges that you have faced? How did you overcome those challenges and what did you learn from them? We started at a time when uh, the insurance law was introduced in 2007 in uh, UAE. And the same time, there was uh, the financial world crisis which was going on. So there was kind of a lot of mixed responses to our uh, beginning of the hospital during that time. But I was very confident that uh, whatever the crisis is going around, healthcare is going to be the last one which is going to be affected. In fact, we saw uh, an increase in the number of patients visiting the hospitals during those periods because, uh, you know, they, that leads to headaches, that leads to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> psychiatric consultations. Uh, you know, jokes apart, it, it's, again, uh, the, the, the testing times which gives us that opportunity to uh, be what the market needs. But you need to be realistic, you need to set uh, uh, the goals which are achievable and then uh, go all out. You know, going back a little bit in our conversation here, one of the great aggravations that many patients complain about is wait time. And yes. you referenced uh, waiting time and trying to get that down. In your own experience, what are a couple of the tactics, the management tactics to cut wait time? And just to go back to another phrase, make the hospital that much more patient-centered? I think the, the concept was to, uh, to make a network of clinics all across, going to the communities, because we don't want patients to come inside the hospitals when they really don't have to come in, because it's unnecessary cost. It's a uh, lot of headache when people should not be in the hospitals coming inside is, again, something that we don't want to have in our group. So we have started up opening clinics all across the communities where we educate the patients that if it's something that they need on an urgent basis, that's the place to be. But if they are terribly sick, then 
then come to the hospital. So there's a, there's a uh, difficult situation where you educate the, the public and everyone see, wants to see the doctor when they, are, uh, when they are sick and they want to be the first to see the doctor. So again, it's uh, improving the accessibility point of view. You know, it's really interesting because uh, hospitals are there to bring patients in and render services. But from what you've said, one of your tactics here, or one of your strategies really, is to keep patients out of the hospital. Yes. Clinics, wellness programs, better diet, exercise, and all of the above. And I think in that sense, you're delivering health services fully. It's not just what happens when somebody comes in and needs an x-ray. The best thing is they don't come in for an x-ray at all. That's right. And uh, what we have done is we wanted the hospital to do cardiac surgeries, uh, neurosurgery, knee replacements and uh, let the patients who need uh, the wellness programs to go inside the malls, uh, do their shopping, get into these clinics, get themselves checked on a continuous basis because we have launched programs for the disease management of people suffering with diabetes so that they don't uh, miss their medicines that leads into complications and end up spending a lot of money and time on recovering. So. These kind of initiatives have been liked by people. Initially, they are kind of hesitant to go to outreach programs, but once they find value, that is when we can see there's a successful program launched. So what are some of the most surprising, innovative things that you have tried out? I've, I heard something about a dental clinic that was done quite uh, innovatively. Can you tell us that story? Uh, so there was a zoo on the, uh, the outskirts of Abu Dhabi where a lot of children used to go, and I took my uh, children as well. And, uh, I had my uh, one of my clinic managers who was just passing by, and we had a, a good discussion. And he came up to the, with an with interesting idea of, uh, you know, why don't we start a, a dental clinic inside the uh, inside the zoo for the children who comes in, so that they walk in, they get a, a routine checkup done. We identify the caries and you know let them know that there's a carry happening, and. Now, at that time, I thought it's it's a crazy idea, and I, I, I had to give him his, uh, uh, you know, uh, due credit that I finally yielded into his compulsion of opening up the clinic. And now <laughs> we got requests from parents to have some facilities, even for the parents to be in the, in the inside the clinic when they when they come with the children. So, I think there's innovative ideas of reaching out to the masses, especially inside the malls, inside the hypermarkets that you see here as well. Uh, healthcare is going to take a lot of change in the years to come. You know, if you think about the years to come, digital delivery of uh, appraisals, of diagnostics, I, th I think it's out there, still slow to develop. But if we were to sit down in five years, my guess is digital medicine is going to be a big piece of what you're doing. Digital is already there. We have uh, diagnostic imaging, which is connected right across the group and can be reported from any any facility or even from home. So that, again, uh, reduces the need for a lot of radiologists on, on, the, on the ground. And that has really helped in faster decision-making process. So it's all about taking the right decision at the right time using the right technology. And that saves life. You have something called as the golden hour, where you need to be connected. You can't expect when that golden hour is going to happen. It could be on a Sunday. It could be on a holiday. And you don't have people on the facility. And then if you have a digital platform where people can log in see the films, report the, uh, the clinical needs, that could save a lot of uh, hassle for the patients. So uh, just last week, uh, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi was in the U.S. and uh, he was in Silicon Valley talking to a lot of uh, uh, CEOs there about something called Digital India. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think as, uh, as far as I understand it, the plan is to connect more than 600,000 Indian villages through a fiber uh, network. Uh, what kind of opportunities would this provide, do you think, for healthcare uh, providers, especially to people at the bottom of the pyramid who traditionally don't have access to healthcare? I think this could lead to a lot of two way communications when it comes to healthcare delivery. And uh, to reach out to these areas are very difficult. You know, they have their own logistic problems to reach out, to, to take the best of doctors to those rural areas. It's, it's like next to impossible. So, if you have the connectivity, then you have things like telemedicine, which could be used. Mm -hmm. uh, we could have a lot of information uh, passed down to these public in their own languages. So I think you could have a lot of two-way communications. You don't have to wait, essentially, for a complication to happen before uh, they could talk to help. They, they could talk to somebody who can give them the help to, to overcome the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, for a person like yourself, 
going back to, let's say, 06 and 07, you were a professional radiologist, but inside you there was the entrepreneur and, and, and the business person. And for our listeners and our readers who got that entrepreneurial bug somewhere that one day may be more out and more recognized, what, what advice would you have from your own experience on that kind of a transition? I think it's all about that uh, the, the listening to your heart, your, your, your gut feeling, and what you like to do. And I think that's what's very important. I remember when I was doing my training, I always used to think of a day when, you know, I could have a hospital treat a lot of people. That was always inside the heart. And, and there was a time when it came and I have to break the, 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 the mold and come out of it and, and follow my heart. And, and there's no regret because for me at that point of time, the decision was there was no point of return. And I, I can't go back and do practice. So, uh, you know, I think I, I would advise a lot of youngsters to come forward uh, to be in healthcare, especially because the world needs a lot more healthcare than what it is right now. And uh, and there are a lot of good things that you can uh, that you can do to to make money, to to do good for the people. There's a lot of corporate social responsibilities that you can do, and and the world needs a lot of people uh, from here. Give it a try. Yes, why not? <laughs> so one, one of the key attributes of any good entrepreneur, and I think you referred to it somewhat in your previous answer, uh, is the ability to pick the right team. Uh, and and uh, I was listening to Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook talking about how he selects people uh, who are his direct reports. And it, he said, what I look for is if I am willing to work for that person, then I hire that mm -hmm. person to work for mm -hmm. me. What do you look for in your team? Uh, you know, for me, uh, it's about uh, people with the right attitude, the people uh, who don't feel that they have done it all, they have seen it all, who would still have uh, the fire in their belly, something to prove, and, uh, you know, uh, treat people with a lot of respect. And, and for us, we always had an issue with job descriptions. When, when I remember the first CEOs that I hired and they asked me for a job description, and I said that you tell me what you can do for us. So that was an approach that I've taken, and I still follow that. And uh, I used to call a lot of the, the top directors when they join, I used to call them personally uh, on a disguised name so that I get a, a good first-hand <laughs> experience of how they are with people at a lower level. So uh, kind of freestyling when, when it comes to recruiting senior people, uh, they need to uh, be people-oriented, people-driven, yet taking decisions, and not afraid of the eventualities. And looking back over the eight years since you uh, founded the hospital itself, could you pick out an incident or a decision or a time that seemed except exceptionally challenging? And just walk us through what happened and what decision you reached. Because we keep taking these tough decisions on a, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on, on a uh, daily basis. But some of the decisions were we have to build a, a tertiary care hospital. And we were given a real estate uh, building. Uh, and, the, and, and we were only given 10, 15 days to decide whether we need the building or not. And it was a commercial building at that time. So we, we uh, you know, brought some consultants from US. They came and said it's not going to be possible. And uh, that was a very difficult moment. And then uh, I remember one of the, the local architects on the site, he gave me a solution for cutting across the vertical transportation. And that was a challenge. And I have to completely trust on him to take that building, which was something like a 200 million project. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking back, uh, uh, that's something uh, of a feather in our, in our cap. And, and it has done extremely well. The, the hospital, which looked like a hotel, feel like a, a different environment altogether. We have uh, gourmet kitchens inside. We have uh, the music playing all the time. People come in to have a cup of coffee. So that's the building. You know, just a, a quick observation of what you've said with a question uh, to it. A lot of learning what you do now, you've learned by doing it. You have got out. You went out. You made a decision. Should we open up a clinic at a zoo? I don't know, but let's try it and see what happens. You so call it paid experience. You know, some yeah, of it works. <laughs> some of it works. Yeah. Some, some failed. We had closures. But we learn from every mistake. We try hard not to repeat the mistakes. But eventually, you know, keep doing the same mistakes. Yeah. But again, it's the 80-20 uh, rule. You know, the 20% of those things which clicks very well uh, compensates everything. Yep. So we have, uh, I think, about a minute or so left. And for the, uh, I wonder if I can ask you to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing. Where do you see you and the enterprise going 
versus the next seven or eight years. You've already come a long way during the past seven or eight years. We What's want next? To, we want to go global. We want to uh, be in a lot of more markets than what we are right now. We want to provide a lot more advanced care for the less privileged across the world. Uh, we have manufacturing activities. We, uh, we uh, are getting very strong into the manufacturing activities as well. So what we feel is that we have to build a, a healthcare ecosystem where uh, we have an integrated uh, healthcare delivery approach where we control the various aspects of healthcare delivery, right from patient care, the logistics, supply chain, the, the pharmaceuticals, the back end, the IT, the home care. So we, we feel that that's where we need to go. It's a long journey. Uh, Shamshir, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today, Mike. Uh, yeah, thank you. Great this has been terrific. Thank you. We thank appreciate you, Mike. your coming from Abu Dhabi. Uh, Wonderful. Thank, thank you for you. joining us. It was a great experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Wonderful. being on the Knowledge at Wharton Show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.